That's not the way I believe. Would it be alright if I shared with you what I believe? Because we need to stand up and we need to be heard and we need to speak into the speak light into the darkness of this world. And folks, there is a darkness in our world. There's an evil in our world that I have never felt with with the, with the intensity that I feel it today. And God is raising the church up to speak into that darkness words of life and truth. And we need the opportunity to do that. The teacher's not lying to you, miss. But the teachers by law today can't teach creation in school. They can't teach in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth because the Supreme Court 7 to 2 decision in 1987, just that short time ago, 1987, made it illegal to teach creationism in public school. But your teacher who's teaching you evolution because she's mandated to do that may be a believer too. And if you say to the teacher, that's not the way I believe, can I tell you how I believe? She would be happy to let you share that because you can share it in the classroom. The teacher can. You can share it in the classroom. The teacher can. Why? <laughs> Why? Does it take being brave to do that? Yes. Yes, it does. I was sitting in a college class at a Christian school and the teacher who was the head of the religious department at the school was teaching lies to the kids that were listening. There was over 500 kids sitting in the big auditorium and he's, he's, he's saying to them, all people will be saved. A loving God could not send anybody to hell. Hell doesn't exist. It's, it, and I raised my hand and I confronted him in front of 500 other students. And unfortunately, the other students applauded when I confronted him about what he was saying because there were a lot of other kids in the room didn't believe what he was saying either, but nobody would raise their hand and say, that's not right. I ended up getting a really bad grade in that class. <laughs> that had nothing to do with that statement. <laughs> All to do with that statement. But it was important to make the statement because 500 kids sitting in the room were being taught something that wasn't of the Word of God, it wasn't truth, it was a lie. We need to stand up and we need to be counted in the church today. So, God bless you for being here. I'm going to ask Miss Deeker to come and open some prayer this morning. Can I say something about the kids? Sure. Um, what's your name? Kiara. 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 Mm -hmm. It is very hard to stand up in front of the class. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was a sophomore in a junior class of biology, so I was the underclassmen. But our science teacher, Mr. Miller, and this was way back, he called us an animal and he was teaching us evolution. And when he called me an animal, I got up and I had my desk and I said, Mr. Miller, I'm not an animal. I, and I told him how God created the animals and then he created a human being. And I've got an A in the house. <laughs> 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 which, which I was failing because I most of my grade was on my participation in talking. <laughs> and every time he wanted me to speak, he called such an animal. Oh. And I get up. <laughs> I quoted how he created the earth and everything. You can't do it today, well, I can, but uh, it's very hard to do. But do it. Amen. It's worth it. Okay? Well, good morning, everybody. How's everyone today? I am so blessed to be here today. Um, this weekend, I went to a women's retreat. And I just remember two things that she said to us. Um, the first thing that she said was Proverbs 11. And that says that the fruit of the righteousness is the tree of life, and that he that winneth souls is wise. And she said that we should keep building up and not breaking down 
And then she asked us a question. Are you building a tower or are you building an altar? She also said, and this just really stuck with me. It's not that I haven't heard it before, but it just really stuck with me. She said, no sacrifice, no anointing. No prayer, no power. If you want to make God weary, keep asking him. Just look at Luke 18, 5. She said, you have to get continued prayer. She said, no praise, no healing. So all of those things just stuck with me over the weekend. And, and the best part of the thing is, we were there for two days, and the manifestation of the Spirit showed up in fullness, and uh, we just got blessed. So I just wanted to share that with you. And uh, if you were going to prayer with me, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you today under the sound of my voice for each and every person that's here in the room today. We ask that you come in and that you sup with each and every person. You know what each and every person needs. You said you created us before the heavens was founded. You said you know the hairs that's numbered on our head. Lord, we invite you in this morning to touch us, to lead us, to guide us, renew us. Give us strength. Because you said so shall the day be long, so shall our strength be. Lord, we ask for deliverance. We ask for deliverance in our studies. We ask that you come in and that you would break the fall ground today. Lift somebody up, change them, give them new ground to stand on. Lord, we thank you for your presence. But we want your presence. We want your presence. There's nothing in this world better than his presence. Not the presence that we see. We thank you, Lord, in advance. We ask that you come in and uh, decree and declare, commanded and demanded that your presence is here today. Come in and speak with us. Love us like we want to love you. We ask that you touch the speaker of the day. Give him words of wisdom. Let him win someone's soul today because it is wise. We ask that you just touch each and every person here. Touch the worship team that they sing in one chord just like they did a minute ago when they sung the song. And Lord, for Alan, you know who he is and where he is and what's going on with him. Nobody can heal him like you. So we call on you because we know who to call. We know who to call. And we thank you in advance for Alan. We thank you in advance for each and every person that's sitting in the room to hear it right now. We thank you for each and every person that's not here right now. But you know where each and every person is. God, just come in and show up with us today. We thank you in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Enjoying just worshiping the Lord today. Yes. Trying to settle into how are we operating in these days, and we've decided that we're having an official worship practice at 4:30 on Wednesdays. But it's also nice to come here at nine o'clock and to sing and to play together. So that's what we've been doing. So thank you for everybody that came. And sure, great to see Mike and our drummers there. Any kids want to come up and join him for this first song? We're going to sing, This is the Day and I Will Enter His Gates. Yeah. Peter's up here on the from the band eh? <laughs> You need any instruction there, Mike?
has made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. Yes, yes. 
Greg says we might want to mention the offering. We lost the one side room. Do we have a, a blanket? There's a, dish up front. There's a dish up front if you have an offering. Uh, just when you feel. Actually, let's pray over our offering and uh, give thanks to the Lord before Rick comes and speaks. If you have an offering to bring, maybe now would be the time. But Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessing. You love to bless us, Lord, and thank you for your love. And Lord, you have an order, and you have a way, and you have a plan. And part of that is to trust you with our finances. And I thank you during this time of being closed and shut down. You've been faithful through your people to provide for this particular congregation. And Lord, we pray that you continue to do that. Not for our benefit, but for the benefit of our community, Lord. That we can continue to go out and have a place here that represents you, Lord. That has doors open for the community to come and to worship. And we pray for our community, Lord. We pray your blessings that would be poured over our community. And let there be salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Again, thank you for being here this morning. Uh, the Lord has uh, kept me up at nights and pestered me and spoke to my heart and challenged me. And, um, I've said to him many times, you're trying to pour all this stuff into a Joe Biden brain and it's not working real good. But thanks for trying. Um, three weeks ago when Scott was preaching, uh, in the middle of his message, God spoke to me very clearly, just like I'm talking to you right now. And he says, Rick, he said, you need to teach your people to keep their eyes on Israel and Jerusalem. I didn't know what that meant when he said it to me. But in the last three weeks, he has just poured and poured and poured into my heart. And I want to share with you what he's saying this morning, because we are living... in a amazing time. I believe that in the next moments, much of the prophecy of this book is, is going to be fulfilled in, and much of it in our own watching and our own seeing and our own experiencing. <coughs> Uh, I have purposely stayed away from eschatology. Eschatology is the study of end times. And I've watched so many Christians over the years get caught up in end time stuff and, and get lost. And so I've just purposely kind of stayed away from all of that. But that's changing in my heart. Uh, in Sunday school class we were talking today about standing up for things and, and Staying true to what God is saying to you, irregardless of the competition you get or the criticism you get for doing it. And I'm going to share some things today with you that I just want you to contemplate. But we are, we are standing on the edge of the return of Christ. We're standing on the edge of what God is going to do in our world. And we know enough end time stuff that enough to confuse us, but hopefully what God is going to do in the next weeks is enlighten our hearts, teach us and show us what He's doing so that we can be prepared and ready for it when it's happening. Because it's going to happen, it's going to unfold right in front of our eyes in a very brief period of time. Uh, what I need you today to do is just imagine with me a minute, we're in a big auditorium and we're facing the stage and on the stage, there's curtains, and the curtains are closed. We have the handbill of the play we're going to watch in our hands. We can read the characters. We can read a little bit about the storyline. We can see what's going to happen before us. And as we're sitting there waiting, uh, we can hear behind the curtain little noises happen. We can hear the noises of the people setting the sets for what's going to happen. We can hear the nervous actors behind the curtain that are peeking out to see how many people have showed up and whether this person did or that person. You know how that goes. I love dramas. I, I've been to hundreds and hundreds of plays in my lifetime, and I always like that anticipation before the curtains open. What is this all going to be? What's it going to be like? 
And so what I'd like you to do is imagine we're sitting in that auditorium, the stage is set, the curtain opens. The curtain opens to the year A.D. 70. 70 A.D. is an important year in Jewish history. And as we look at the Jewish nation, as we look at Israel and we look at Jerusalem, 70 A.D. is a key and pivotal point. In 70 A.D., as we look upon the stage, we see the Roman soldiers coming down from the Judean hills, destroying homes, capturing people as they're coming into Jerusalem. And as they enter into the gates of Jerusalem, they're plundering everything there and they're destroying the buildings. Not rock, one stone is set upon another. They take captive the Hebrew people living in Jerusalem. They go into the temple and they desecrate the temple and tear the temple down and take all the valuable things out of the temple. And we see that whole destruction taking place. They're tearing the very heart of God's chosen nation, scattering the precious children of Israel to the far corners of the earth. That was 70 A.D. The next picture we get in scene two, we fast forward 1867 years. The year is 1867. It's been 1,800 years, 1,800 years since the people were taken from Jerusalem to, in Jerusalem and Israel was destroyed and laid a barren wasteland. For 1,800 years, the Israeli people have been scattered to the far corners of the earth. In 1867, in the harbor of San Francisco, it's a little ship. The ship is called the Quaker City. In the harbor city, moored there at the dock, and people are getting on board because that ship, the Quaker City, is getting ready to sail to Europe and then to the Holy Land. On that ship, and in that line of people getting onto the ship, is a young man by the name of Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens. Yes, the person who wrote, Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn, the celebrated jumping frog of Calaveras County. Some of those stories we read as kids. He was entering that ship because he'd been hired by a media company to go to Israel and go to Jerusalem and document what he saw there. That was 1867. He gets on the ship, he travels to Europe and then to the Holy Lands. When he arrives at the Holy Lands, this is what he sees. Let me read it to you. Rags, wretchedness, poverty, and dirt. Lepers, cripples, the blind. To see the number of maimed, malformed, and disfigured humanity that throng the holy places. All desolate and unpeopled. Miles of desolate country. The far-reaching desolation. The waste of limitless desolation. It is a scorching, arid, repulsive solitude. Such roasting heat and oppressive solitude. And such dismissal. Desolation cannot rarely exist everywhere on the earth. Nowhere in all the waste around there was a foot of shade and we were scorching to death. This is Israel he's describing in 1867. One may ride ten miles hereabouts and not see ten human beings. These unpeopled deserts, these rusty mounds of barrenness that never, never, never do shake the glare from their harsh outlines. There is not a solitary village throughout its whole extent for 30 miles in either direction. The valleys are unsightly deserts, fringed with a feeble vegetation. The desert paved with loose stones, void of vegetation, glaring in the fierce sun, blistering naked, treeless land. The grass, no grass grows in it, not even a blade of grass. 
No sprig of grass is visible. Palestine is desolate and unlovely. And why should it be otherwise? Can the curse of the deity beautify a land? You get a picture? That's Mark Twain in 1867 describing Israel and Jerusalem. If I look in scripture, and I go to the book of Deuteronomy, you ever heard that book, Kara? <laughs> they study the books of the Old Testament in their Sunday school class. So. Here's what it says in Deuteronomy as a, as a prophecy of God. And see if it has any kind of matching sound to what I just read from 1867 Mark Twain's account. The whole land will be a burning waste of salt and sulfur. Nothing planted, nothing sprouting, no vegetation growing in it. It will be like the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, which the Lord overthrew in fierce anger. All the nations will ask, why has the Lord done to this land? Why his fierce burning anger and the answer will be, it is because its people abandoned the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, the covenant he made with them. And he brought them out of Egypt. They went off and worshipped other gods and bowed down to them. Gods they did not know, gods he had not given to them. Therefore the Lord's anger burned against them in their land. And he brought on it all the curses written in this book. In furious anger and in great wrath, the Lord uprooted them from their land and thrust them to another land as it is now. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of the Lord. So here in Deuteronomy, that's Deuteronomy chapter 29, verses 23 and following, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is the fifth book in the scriptures written thousands of years ago. Thousands of years ago. And we see in 1867, if you haven't read this book, I'd encourage you to do so, but in 1867 we see Mark Twain being paid to go to Israel and to describe what he's, what he's what is written there. Now the interesting thing about this is that not only did Mark Twain do this, but he wrote a book on this account that came out into the public about two years after the fact. The book was called Innocence Abroad. And it was the highest selling book that Mark Twain ever wrote. Sold more copies than Tom Sawyer, sold more copies than Huck Finn. 1867. God is beginning to do something. And one of the things you learn about the Jewish people is they believe that God is in control of our lives and God is in control of the world and He's actively moving in it every moment of every day, 24-7. The Hebrew people see that. They understand that concept. So God has, has started a process at the same time, 1867, that Mark Twain was in Israel taking this account, at the same time an English engineer named Charles Warren was also in Jerusalem. He had been commissioned by the English government to go to Jerusalem and to Israel to do archaeological digs and to measure the land. He went into Israel, he, he, this is 1867, same time that Mark Twain was there. He began to measure the walls of Jerusalem. He began to measure and dig inside of Jerusalem to discover where the temple was, where, where, where all the descriptions in the, in, in the Bible were of things in Jerusalem. So in 1867, here's Mark Twain coming from the United States western United States from San Francisco. Here's Warren coming from 
England. They're not only in Jerusalem at the same time, they're actually staying at the same hotel at the same time, though they never met, never knew the other one was there. Both of them have been sent by their countries to do something specific. Warren was there to do probably the most significant archaeological thing ever done in Jerusalem and Israel before everything began to happen again. He went in, he was able to find where everything and document where everything was located and to set a, a template, if you will, for what God is going to do and what God is doing for the Hebrew people. I said keep your eyes on Israel and keep your eyes on Jerusalem. God is working there and he's doing interesting things. Fast forward now from 1867 to 1917 and you'll note that the time between 1867 and 1917 is 50 years. Why is 50 years significant? Because in the Jewish mind, 50 years represent Jubilee. Jubilee is the returning of people who have lost their land back to their land. Now remember, 1,800 years, Israel had been scattered to the far corners of the earth. Israel was laid waste. It was a barren wasteland. Only few people lived there, and those were the crippled and the maimed that hadn't been taken away. They just were left there. Nothing could grow. Nothing could exist in 1867. 1917... Another year of Jubilee, a 50-year period of time, God was going to do some significant things in 1917 for the people of Israel. Because of international intervention by England, Jerusalem is under Jewish sovereignty for the first time in nearly 2,000 years. So between 1867 and in 1917, something had happened. Now, a lot of you don't know English history because you studied American history in school, but English history is interesting. England conquered, at one time, over 90% of the entire world. They had territories they owned all the way from Hong Kong, China, India, all but 22 countries. All but 22 countries in the world were at one time owned and ruled by Britain. So in 1867, when Britain sent Warren to Israel to measure things, it's because they were a commonwealth. They had possessions of properties all over the place. Things began to happen in, 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 in England in that God sent Jewish people into England that developed friendships and relationship with English aristocracy, English political people. And people in England who were not Jewish began to have a burning desire in themselves for, for Israel to be able to return to their land. Does that make sense? So in, 19, in 1917, which is 50 years, a year of Jubilee, other things began to happen. A man by the name of Alfred Balfour, a man of deep Christian conviction and a member of the parliament, developed a close relationship with a Jewish man called Chaim uh, Wiseman. Their friendship caused Balfour to develop a passion to help Israel to return to their homeland. The problem was that their homeland was the property of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire, like England, conquered lots of land, especially in the Holy Land. They were as an Islamic group of people coming out of the area we know as Arabia, which now is Saudi Arabia area, Jordan, Egypt, that area. The Ottomans owned the Holy Lands. The Ottoman Empire during World War II or World War, yeah, World War I, excuse me, the Ottoman Empire sided with Germany, which put the Ottoman Empire at odds with Russia, England, and the United States. We were allies together, but the Ottomans sided with Germany. 
And so as World War I went on, um, that area was battled over and the Ottoman Empire lost the battle that was going on there. Um, there was a fellow by the name of General uh, Edmund Allenby. He was sent by England to Israel to take over the army of the English people of the British Commonwealth in that area and to put the battle together. When he got there and assessed what was going on, they had already lost a lot of battles to the Ottomans during that time. But he felt, he sensed in his heart that it was important that he build a air force that he would control in that area. Now imagine in 1917, the planes were pretty rudimentary, right? Wright Brothers just invented flying of, of a 20 years earlier. So he's there, but he puts this Air Force together. The Air Force probably doesn't even have the ability to drop bombs and do stuff like this. They don't have guns to shoot out of them. What they did was surveillance. So he could fly over the area and he could see where the Ottoman troops were located. And he was able to go in with a small army of people because of their airplanes and destroy that whole area and to take it over for England. So in 1917, Allenby defeated the Ottomans and opened up the door for Israel for the first time for Israeli people to find a sovereign uh, ownership of Israel again. 1900 years, 1900 years, after they had been driven out by the Roman Empire. 50 years after 1867, so a year of Jubilee. Jubilee is the returning of your land. Forgiveness of debt. Jubilee in the Jewish culture is a huge thing. So we fast forward from 1917 to 1948. World War II has ended. With the end of World War II, um, over six million Jews had been destroyed in concentration camps, camps by Germany. Six million people. Germany also killed another five million non-Jewish people. So 11 million people died in World War II. World War II had ended. Um, many, for the first time in, after World War II, many Jews returned to Israel. So for the first time we see a real peopling of the Israeli area by Israel people, their homeland being given back to them. Um, the problem was that Ottoman people that were still living in the area now were called Palestinians and the Palestinians didn't like Israel and didn't want to share the land with Israel and so they had a civil war that started in 1947 to 1948 and in that war Palestine is trying to drive Israel out of the Holy Lands that God is giving back to them by increments to every Jubilee year that he's returning opportunities to them. So we move from the Civil War in 47 and 48 to 1967. 1967 is again 50 years after 1917. So another year of Jubilee in 1967. English and American pressure and new international laws allowed Jews to return in huge quantities. And uh, in 1967, there was what was called the Six Day War. And some of you here are young enough to remember that. 
In a matter of, of hours, Israel went from this battling with Palestine for areas and land and so on and so forth uh, to the destruction and to the opportunity to uh, uh, come back to Jerusalem to settle in it and the Six Day War opened up the opportunity for about 300% population growth in Israeli area because of what God had done at that time. There's all sorts of interwoven, interesting phenomena that's going on. Who, who did this and who was called to do that and how it happened and the names of people. In Jewish culture, names really mean something. Timing really means something. Filter of scripture really means something. And there's, a whole, there's so much to this that we don't understand. But in 1967, another year of Jubilee, Six Day War happens and everything changes. Now, the, the growth of Hebrew people coming back to their homelands, a year of jubilee, the sounding of the shofar. Did you bring the shofar today? Where is it? You forgot? I did. See? I know. We were going to open the service with the shofar today. Uh, but speaking of the shofar, I'm going, to, I'm going to jump forward right now to a year that will sound more familiar than 1967. How about 2017? Is that getting closer? Mm -hmm. 2017 is 50 years from 1967. Another year of Jubilee in 2017. What happened in 2017? 2017, President Trump declared that Israel was officially that Jerusalem was officially the capital city of Israel. Yes. Now, if you read your Bible about trumpets, trumpets are all called, also called in Jewish culture so far. But trumpets, trumpets are sometimes called trumps. The trump will sound. Every jubilee year, every jubilee year is ushered in with the sound of the shofar, the sound of the trumpets. So Trump resounded in 2017. And Israel, for the first time since 70 AD, was declared, Jerusalem was declared the capital city of Israel. A year later, in 2018, America moved their embassy, and so now have other countries have moved their embassy to Jerusalem. Now, when I said what I wanted to talk to you about is, is Israel, keep, put your eyes on Israel, watch Israel, look at Israel, see Israel, and look also at Jerusalem. If we look at history, and not only that just history, but in years of Jubilee, which are real significant to the Israeli people, Jubilee is a huge, important time. Uh, how many ever saw the movie Fiddler on the Roof? There's a song in Fiddler on the Roof called Tradition, 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 Tradition. You hear him singing that as a song? Remember that? Okay. Tradition to an Israeli person is, is hugely important. One of the big things they do is they celebrate certain events and certain days in their culture. We, we know Yom Kippur and we don't know what they mean, we don't know what they're for, because we don't celebrate them in Christendom, unfortunately. But in the Jewish mind, those days are extremely important, and they're extremely important for a reason. Kids, hear what I'm saying here, because this is important, okay? They remember important dates because they want their children to remember what God did for Israel on that day. And the only way your children are going to know is because you celebrate the day and you commemorate it as an important thing. We do things like Halloween and Easter and Christmas and Thanksgiving. In the Hebrew culture, they do them for the day that God take, took them out of Egypt. They do it for the day that God protected the firstborn of Israel while all the others were killed. They do it for the day that God did this and God did that and God said this and God said that. Because they want to pass to their children that God is active, God is working, God is doing, God is making things happen in His way, in His time, 
in His will. And folks, we're setting in a time in our lives right now where God is moving. Let me, let me show with you how close this is. Pastor Rob, on the 5th of September, was preaching from the 10th chapter of the book of John. You know, he's taking us through the book of John. So he's preaching from the 10th chapter of the book of John. And he got to the scripture that says, I have other sheep that you know not of. And he made this statement. This is on September 5th. He made this statement. Maybe that's what Rick's son Dan has been talking about. Now, I never thought about this before because what he said at that day is Abraham had two sons. His oldest son, his first son, was called Ishmael. God had promised Abraham when he was a young man that he was going to have a son, and his son was going to people the earth more than the stars in the sky or the sands on the beach. He's now 90 years old, or close to it, and he has no children. His wife's 80. He has no children. So his wife says, honey, I've got an idea. I've got this cute little maidservant here. Why don't you take her and maybe God will bless you with a son through her. Now Sarah was probably had too much pizza or something and was not thinking brightly when she made that statement because when Hagar got pregnant, oh my goodness, Sarah's nose got bent out of shape. She was still barren. She was upset. She threw a hissy fit. Have you ever seen a hissy fit? She threw one. And she told Abraham, you got to get rid of that woman. You got to get rid of that kid. So Abraham sent Ishmael, his oldest son, through Hagar, the maidservant of his wife, out into the wilderness. Later on, Sarah at age 90, Abraham at 100, Sarah got pregnant. She had a son called Isaac. Isaac was about 13 years younger than Ishmael. Ishmael's now out of the picture. He's living somewhere else. So Abraham has two children. He has Ishmael and Isaac. Isaac is the father of the Hebrew nation of Israel. Ishmael is the father of the Islamic nation, the Muslim world. And those two nations have been, at, those two people, sons, family members, same father, different mom, have been at war with one another ever since that time. And Pastor Rob said, is it possible what your son Dan's been saying that God is going to have a messianic Islam movement and bring the children of Israel and the children of Ishmael, Muslims, into a harmony with one another. Fifteen days later, Pastor Rob, and you had no idea this was going on. Fifteen days later, we have what's called the Abraham Accord in Israel. What is the Abraham Accord? It's the covenant between two Muslim nations, Bahrain and the Emirates, make a pact, a peace pact with Israel for the first time. They say many other countries, many other Islamic countries are going to make this same kind of move so that the, the family of Ishmael and the family of Isaac, for the first time in ever in our history, are moving into accord with one another. Nobody would have ever believed this could happen. This year, 2020, September the 15th, we saw on television the Abraham Accord. Rob didn't know this. Behind the scenes, and folks, this is true. Behind the scenes, God is moving. God is moving. God is moving. He's bringing to fruition what His plan is for our country and for our world. Genesis 17. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. 
I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation. Genesis 17, talking about Isaac. God made this covenant with Isaac. The whole world, the whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give to you as an everlasting possession, to you and to your descendants, after you, and I will be their God. Ten days after Pastor Rob preached his message, God was moving. Thanks, and starting to bring together <laughs> two children that have been at odds with one another for about 4,000 years. The year of Jubilee happens every 50 years, 1867, 1917, 1967, 2017. The next Jubilee will be 2067. Jubilee is defined as slaves and prisoners would be free, debts would be forgiven, aliens returned to their homeland, and mercies of God would be particularly manifest. If we were to go to Jerusalem today, if we were going to Israel today, we would find a land that looked very different than the land described by Mark Twain in 1867. Today, Israel is the fulfillment of what God promised in the Old Testament. He said to the Hebrew people, I will take you to a land flowing with milk and honey. Israel is one of the most prosperous, beautiful gardens in the world today. Uh, I could go through a list of things. Their water, their farmland, their military, their medical, their constructions, their financial wealth, their self-sufficiency. They're an unbelievable nation, tiny nation, but so blessed by God. From 1867 to the present day, you would not recognize anything about the country. I've been following a, a, a Israeli major who's a part of the Mossad, which is their elite army group, like we'd have Green Berets and stuff here. The Mossad, and he makes this statement. He said, I honestly believe the Israeli army is stronger than any army in the world, including the United States. He said, let me tell you why I say that. We have all the, we have all the current and most uh, advanced American weaponry in our country. The difference between the United States and Israel is this. We actually have to use the weaponry we have. We're out there using it on a daily basis. So American soldiers love to train with Israeli soldiers because Israeli soldiers actually have combat experience with the weapons the United States has given to them. If you imagine Israel is just a tiny country surrounded by its enemies for all these years, coming back into existence in 1867, and now becoming a prosperous garden land, uh, uh, this Israeli soldier was saying, 85% of the water used, you'll like this water man back here, 85% of the water used in Israel is repurified and reused, and repurified and reused, and repurified and reused on a regular basis, on a daily basis, 85% of the water. That's why they can water the plants and why it's turned into a garden and why it's done when it's done. The riches and the wealth that are there is unbelievable. I will, I'll close with this. There's something happening in Israel right now. There's something happening in the world that we don't hear in our newspaper. But it's important for us to hear and to understand this. God is moving. Israel has discovered rich natural gas resource in their country. Russia has natural gas resources in their country. Russia has built a pipeline, spent billions and billions and billions of dollars for this pipeline to move the pipeline in through Germany into Europe and sell Russian natural gas in Europe. A few months ago, one of our senators 
discovered this was happening, went to Miss Merkel, the leader of Germany, and said, are you a part of NATO? She said, well, yes, we are. Then why are you serving Russia to bring their wealth into Europe? And he stopped the pipeline from being completed. It's only one mile from completion. Israel has now built a pipeline under the Mediterranean Sea to bring their natural gas into Europe. How do you suppose Russia feels about that? There's rumbling, and, and if, you, if you keep your eyes on Israel and watch what's happening, watch, watch who's attacking, watch who's, what they're saying in international news in relationship to Russia, you're going to see, you're going to see a, a, a rumble going on that will just absolutely make your blood run cold. There's stuff happening, as we said here today, in the world that is going to bring much of the prophecy of this book into fruition in a matter of moments. We have coming up in our country in 16 days an election. I don't know who's going to win the election, but I think irregardless of who wins the election, we're going to see some really difficult things hit us in the next weeks and months. Uh, how many have been watching on news the anarchy going on in lots of our cities. In fact, we have a city that's up to and used to do so because this warfare that's going on right now is a real warfare, folks. There is evil in this world and there's evil possessing other people that are going to make living as a Christian a real difficult thing for us to do. And praise God, we need that. We need to get away from the fat and sassy and get to the lean and mean. We need, to, we need to say what's really going on and what's really in our hearts because we know, folks, I, I, I don't recognize the country I live in. I don't recognize what's happening in this country because there's a war going on. There's evil going on. If Satan knows it's the end of his time, folks, he's going to raise his head and he's going to growl and scream toothless power, but he's going to do it and he's going to make it a mess for everybody around him. But folks, greater is he that is in us than he is in the world. And the in us is going to raise his head and he's going to do some amazing things and we're right in the middle of that happening. What a time to be alive to see the word of God manifest itself. To see the word of God unfolding itself in front of us. And folks, I know it was boring listening to what I shared with you this morning, but it's important for you to understand a little bit of a picture that's going on. And I do not have a picture with any ways of making a stage so that you can see 1867 dry, barren, lifeless land, now made this beautiful homeland for the people of Israel to return to. The jubilee of being returned to your homeland. I listened to the, what's called the return here a couple weeks ago and heard shofars going on in every corner of the earth as it was happening. God has always announced His plans. Or his plan to do something specific with the shofar. All through, all through Israeli history, the shofar, the trumpet has been sounded and resounded. He's sounding the trumpet today and he's calling us into something that's extremely important. And so God told me to tell you, keep your eyes on Israel and Jerusalem. I've started watching three people, Jewish men, on the internet. I haven't found a Jewish woman yet, but I'll watch her too if, if God leads me to one. Jonathan Kahn. Who wrote this book and others. This one's called The Oracle, and it's the story that I just shared with you this morning. If you haven't read it, you need to read it. It's a powerful, powerful book. He also wrote the book, the first book I wrote of his was The Harbinger, which is about... 9-11, he's an amazing writer, an amazing scholar, and a voice, clearly voice, clear voice of God in our country right now today. I've been studying also this major that's a part of the Israeli army. His name is Amir, A-M-I-R, 
uh, Tsarfati, T-S-A-R-F-A-T-I. And you can look him up on YouTube, and lots of his messages have been listening to him. And then about a year ago, we were blessed by a little, little Hebrew rabbi that came and spoke out here at our address. Anybody, anybody at that? Raise your hand if you were at that. Three of us? I was moved at that point in time in my heart that Israel was key and I needed to have my eyes on it. So I, that was the first time I understood for my own calling, but for God's saying, tell your people to get your eyes on Israel and Jerusalem. That happened a couple weeks ago. He's a little fellow by the name of Rabbi Daniel Varga. And uh, Vargas. Vargas, that's right. I, I, I've been watching him the last few days. Uh, his mind will go places mine will never get to. But he's a, a fascinating little teacher and uh, gives great insight into what God is doing. Those are three places you can go on your internet to see how God is moving in our country today. Um, really encourage you to do that. Let me close by saying this. Is there, is there any question or any thought that you want to add to what I've shared this morning? Yes, sir. I would just like to say, if you have not seen the return and you don't want to watch the whole thing, on YouTube is Jonathan Kahn's sermon that he gave at that thing. And it's like 40 minutes long. And if you haven't seen it, the breaking of the pot, you need to see it. It's very, very powerful. Pierre, remember when he broke the pot? <clears throat> Pierre said, I knew he was going to do that. <laughs> uh, we just watched it in our men's group this last Wednesday. So if you haven't been to men's group Wednesday at 2 o'clock right here in River City, uh, we watched that, and it is more than 40 minutes. It's at least an hour long, but it's definitely worth watching. And you'll see the prophetic word that comes out of it. It's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Yes? It's called what? The return. The return. In the middle of it, probably 40 minutes into it, God thunders. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's and speaking, and a couple times you hear the thunder he behind you. thunder when he's talking. God is speaking. Yeah. God speaks through thunder. Yeah. He's speaking. There's also a fresh measure of grace coming because the scripture says where lawlessness does abound, grace will much more abound. Amen. Darkness will never get bigger than grace. It will never catch up. So whatever we face, there will be always enough grace and more to spare. Enough and beyond. That's right. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's not a scary time we're living in. It's not a sad time we're living in. This is a joyous time. Amen. God, let me, let me illustrate this way. I've had the privilege, I guess I call it privilege, to be in the delivery room when mamas are having their babies. And I discovered something really interesting about that. When you're at home, you're pregnant, you're nine months pregnant and you're due, and the, you get the first pain, birth pain that happens, it's uncomfortable, and you say to your hubby, I think it's time. I think it's time. <laughs> then the water breaks. <laughs> and you get to the hospital. Even, even after the water breaks and you get to the hospital, the pains are coming, and they're coming more intensely and more often. You ladies know this story better than I do. But here's what I saw as a man. Folks, when it comes time for birth, everything changes. <laughs> the intensity of that room goes to a level that you, as a man, can't imagine. And you're sorry you ever made that happen. Okay, that, that's, that's where we are right now, okay? The, I, I think the birth pains have already started. I shared with you 1867, the birth pains have started. I think the water's even broken. Mm. I think we're at the hospital. Mm. I think that's where we're at right now. And what we're going to see right now is, is the pain become more intense. Jesus. We're going to see it become more frequent. And then the birth. Life. Yep. 
Jesus shows up. <laughs> the bird. Folks, we're in a, we're in a fantastic moment in, in time. I, I, I can't believe I'm still alive. Ray, we're still alive. We're, we're going to see all this stuff we've been waiting for our lifetime. We're going to see it unfold in front of us. And what a time, what a time, what a time to be alive. Not a time for fear, a time for victory, a time that we don't have to worry about how God's going to use us. We're going to be thrust into being used by God. And when that happens, just say, yes, Lord, here am I. Use me, use me, use me, use me, use me. Yesterday, last night, I got the Spirit came to me and said, you've come too far to give up now. That's right. Right? That's what you just said. You've come too far. We're not that far away right now. Remember when you used to get bubble gum and you'd open it up and it'd have a comic inside of it? Yeah. Remember those gums? A, a double... I can't remember what they were called. Bazooka. What? Bazooka. 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 Yeah, okay. There was, a, there was a character in those cartoons, and I remember this cartoon vividly. He decides, he's a big kind of lummox guy, and he's, he's going to swim the English Channel. And he swims all the way across the English Channel, and he gets within three feet of landing in Europe. He gets so tired he can't go any further, so he turns around and swims back. <laughs> okay, that, that's what Roger is saying. <laughs> You only got three feet to go. Keep going, man. Keep going. Because it's right there. It's in our laps right now. It's such an exciting thing. It's in our laps right now. We need to embrace it. We need to look forward to it. And we need to get those last three strokes in to finish the trip. Don't give up now and swim all the way back because you couldn't go any further. That'd be silly, would it not? Father God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the precious people that live here. Thank you for your word. I apologize for doing such a terrible job with it, but Father, I know what you're saying. We need to be ready. And we'll know, we'll know where to move and how to move by keeping our eyes on Israel, by keeping our eyes on Jerusalem. We're going to get the direction and the understanding and the truth by watching them. Because I know, Father, your scripture was written for them in the beginning. They are your people. They are chosen. Blessed are those who bless Israel. Blessed are those who bless Israel. We want to be blessed, Father. Bless our socks off by us keeping our eyes on them and following their lead to your kingdom, to your glory, and to your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.